So for the three or four people left in the world that haven't seen Avengers, the two most recent films in the series centred around a magical gauntlet that could instantly wipe out exactly half of the population of the universe. The villain's justification was that this was a necessary step to restore balance to a universe that was overpopulated and putting too much of a drain on resources. Now, instantly hazing half of the universe is a bit of a dick move, but when the same world can't go a full week without some news article telling us that a global climate catastrophe is inevitable, natural resources are running dry, or that if everyone lived like the average American, we would need four Earths to sustain them all, it starts to sound like we should hear this Thanos guy out. As much as economics being used as the justification of half-cooked annihilation is dubious at best, there might be some legitimate benefits to this whole finger-snapping business. So what would happen to the economy if half of the world's population suddenly disappeared? Would the survivors actually live a wealthier, more prosperous existence? What would happen to the larger economy? And most importantly, would this really do any good at all? This episode of Economics Explained was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you would like to gain early access to these videos before they're uploaded to YouTube, as well as participate in our exclusive Q&A sessions, please consider supporting our channel on patreon.com slash economics explained. Now of course, half of the world's population suddenly going missing would cause a lot of problems in the short term. It is reasonable to assume that people losing a huge pool of friends and family would not go straight back to work after what would be the largest calamity ever to inflict mankind. So for the sake of this video, we will assume to explore the economy some time after the finger snap. Say, 10 years or so after the event. So with that out of the way, the main centerpiece of this plan was that it would leave behind a grateful universe. If half of the world's population was instantly non-existented, then there would be some instantaneous wins for the survivors. Once they were over the emotional business of missing half the people that they had ever known, they would find that suddenly there is an abundance of new real estate, cars, boats, computers, and all kinds of goodies that were left behind. This should, on average, make everybody in the world twice as asset rich instantaneously. And it would, on average. If we assume that the standard rules around inheritances applied, then there would be a huge concentration of wealth into the accounts of those that already had a lot. Rich people would get richer as the members of their family get vaporized and their collective wealth gets concentrated amongst a pool half its original size. This would also depend on estate taxes, inheritance laws, and the final wills of a few very wealthy people, but overall it is likely to squeeze this chart ever higher. Outside of a few wealthy trust fund babies, it still wouldn't be a terrible outcome for regular workers. The factors of production are land, labour, and capital. We have explored this on the channel before because these are the essential ingredients that you need to make anything. Farmed food needs a lot of land, a little bit of capital, capital just being any form of asset that assists with production, like let's say a combine harvester, and of course, finally, farmed food needs farmers. The same is true for a computer. The land required is much less, but the factories and the warehouses still take up space, the machines that produce computer parts are the capital, and the people that put it all together are the labour. Now, after Thanos has snapped his fingers, a majority of this land and capital will still be in the hands of the people that have always had it. Rich people. But they aren't going to be the ones out there putting together new furniture sets. Because the labour pool has been halved, every worker is going to have access to twice as much land and twice as much equipment on average. What this means is that production will drop, but it will not drop by the same 50% that the population did. A farmer with twice as much land is not necessarily going to have enough hours in their day to produce twice as much food, but they may be able to pick and choose the best soils to work with to make sure that they are not wasting any time that they may have. A factory won't be able to produce as much with half as many workers, but if every worker had access to their pick of the equipment and unlimited overtime, then they wouldn't be producing half as much they might be producing 51% or 99% of what they were originally producing, but it would be somewhere between these two figures, all other things being equal. 
Now, since there is less labor and on average the workers will be producing more per person, they will be paid more, instantly decreasing the supply of labor by 50% while raising the utility value of each individual worker will mean, hey presto, that labour is going to cost more. This is a big win for the working class that happened to be left behind. And don't feel too bad for the wealthy landowners either. Sure, their return on equity won't be quite what it once was, but they will still ultimately have to pay less individual staff members. Now what this all means for non-renewable natural resources is that sure, a little bit less iron ore will be mined and a little less coal will be burnt, but it won't be 50% less. This hypothesis was first put forward by Nobel laureate economist Robert Solo. It should be noted that he didn't win the Nobel Prize for justifying the actions of Thanos, but rather he won the prize in 1987 for his work on modelling growth through the interaction of human labour and productive capital. It just so happens that this model kind of justifies the actions of Thanos. Now one big asterisk that would need to be put next to the great success label on all of this is what it would mean for the wider economy. Winning the snippety snap lottery might have great benefits in the short term for individuals left behind, either through better wages or less hands to share the family fortune between, but long term, things might not be so fantastic. Starting with GDP, this measure on economic success is likely to suffer drastically. To understand why, imagine there is an economy with only two shop owners in it. The only exchange these people make is to buy a $100 birthday present for each other once a year from the birthday boy's shop. Now, excusing the poor manners involved in buying a present from the shop of the recipient, the GDP of this birthday gift centred economy would be $200. $100 for shopkeeper 1's birthday and $100 for shopkeeper 2's birthday. Now, Say that a third shopkeeper moved into this hypothetical economy and made friends with the other two. Well now, they would also get a birthday present once a year as well. How lovely. Standard logic would dictate that GDP would grow by 50% because the population has grown by 50%. But wait, now every birthday involves two people buying a present for the birthday boy and there are three birthdays a year. By adding one extra participant to the nation, the GDP of this birthday present based economy has tripled. This model is of course extremely oversimplified and doesn't account for things like the shopkeeper's personal budgets for gifts in a given year, scarce resources or the eventual limit of how many birthday parties one could reasonably attend, but it does show how the more people there are in an economy, the more people are out buying things gifting things, investing in things, and getting paid for doing things, which all naturally contributes to a higher GDP figure. The speed at which money changes hands is called the velocity of money, and this is a very important measure for addressing things like genuine economic growth and inflation. Halving the number of people in an economy would lead to a reduction in GDP of over 50%. This then means the GDP per person would actually shrink post Thanos snap. But how does this make sense? We just saw earlier that on average, people will be producing more stuff. How is it that everyone would be poorer? Is this some kind of flaw in a wildly speculative economic model? Well, no. In reality, the difference in the increase in workers' productivity and their reduction in GDP per capita would be bridged by a massive reduction in the price level of goods and services. In plain English, things would cost a lot less because there is half as much demand and just as much supply of land and capital. So this GDP figure looks a lot worse even though individuals would actually be better off on average. GDP per capita with adjustments made for purchasing power parity would be greater in a post Thanos snap economy. Alright, so it's still looking pretty good for our purple maniac here, but what would this mean long term? In the very short term, the world would go into complete chaos. For the following years after everyone comes to grip with this new reality, people would do pretty well for themselves. But long term, this would actually be a huge hindrance on mankind. A majority of the prosperity that we enjoy today has come from mankind's ability to innovate. 
From fires that cooked food and illuminated the darkness to nitrogen-based fertilizers which all but did away with famines, there is a lot that we owe to technology. Halving the number of people would halve the number of innovators. The person that comes up with a solution to sustainable fusion or a cure for any number of diseases, productive AI or an easier way to get to space might just have been barbecued. Once an innovation is made, it very quickly finds its way all around the world, boosting output and quality of life for everyone. A breakthrough is not something that can be used up, so having more people to share it between doesn't matter. When there is more people, there is, well, more people thinking and researching and experimenting, waiting for that spark of genius that will lead to the next industrial revolution. This impact alone would likely put humanity back many decades. And all the same, in a future where tens of billions of humans can be supported amongst multiple planets, the rate of technical innovation will compound on itself exponentially. Maybe Thanos didn't share in this optimistic view of human brilliance, but that still doesn't mean that there weren't better alternatives. So while we are in the process of massively overanalyzing a movie that was just supposed to be good fun, we may as well explore the problem that Thanos was trying to solve. Thanos was acting on a solution to the central problem of economics. That is, that people have unlimited desires, but only limited resources in which to fulfill those desires. The entirety of economics as a discipline is an attempt to understand and solve this problem. Many people have many different theories about how best to answer this question. Communism, capitalism, anarchy. But Thanos simply argued that halving the number of people meant that there were more resources left to fulfill the desires of the leftover population, which is one way of doing it. Although it has to be realized that if the Infinity Gauntlet actually did give him unlimited power, he should have probably just doubled the resources of the universe. Same net economic outcome without all the doom and gloom and death. The other thing that this whole model ignores is that eventually populations bounce back. As economies become wealthier, there is less of an incentive to have as many children for a number of reasons. It's expensive to raise children in developed countries, it makes it difficult to balance a career, and there is less of a financial benefit to having more children because Developed countries tend to move away from a model where children will work in a family business and directly support their parents in old age. Look to countries like Japan, where the population is actually shrinking after once being a country with one of the highest birth rates in the world. Post Thanos snap, a lot of these barriers to raising children would be removed, and there may be even greater incentives in the sense that businesses and governments around the world would be desperate for labour and would potentially reward families for raising children. Programs like these already exist and would only stand to become much more widespread and generous. What this would mean is that in a few generations time, the population could be right back where it started. Which either means this finger snapping business would need to become a regular thing, or this whole exercise was ultimately for nothing. So a Thanos finger snap is a fantastic case study that lets us explore a few really interesting areas of economics. And kudos to Marvel for putting forward a workable solution to the central economic problem. Would Thanos really be able to look into a grateful universe that was happier, healthier, and wealthier because of his actions? Well, in the short term, no. In the long term, no. But there may be a few years there where everything is actually great. In the meantime, it's a great way to show why we should be thankful for our fellow man and do everything we can to ensure that people are given every opportunity to live full, healthy, happy lives. Not for any fluffy reasons like moral selflessness, but simply because one of these people out there will eventually invent something that we really like. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this latest video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. This video was suggested by one of our patrons over on Patreon, which Thank you by the way, this was really fun. If you want to have your say about what country or topic we explore next, please consider supporting the channel like these awesome people did. Thanks guys, bye.